So hello Internet <laughs> and welcome to Space in Chile. Today I have the honor to welcome Professor Richard Binzel. So hello Rick. Hello everyone. Nice to be here. So uh, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, I'm a professor of planetary science at MIT. I've been teaching at MIT for more than 30 years and I I love asteroids. I've been observing asteroids since I was uh, a young teenager and um, found them fascinating worlds and uh, continue to study them to this day. So I invited you because a week ago you were at uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida for the launch of a new space mission. Before we talk about this mission, I wanted to ask you, according to you, why do humans feel the need to send rockets in space? Why do humans feel the need to explore the universe? I, I think it's, in, it's intrinsic to us as humans to explore. And you think about the survival of the human species, the migration of the human species. Uh, exploration and migration were essential to our survival. And so I think it's innate in us that we're very curious and we're natural native explorers. And uh, now that we've explored our own planet, I think it's a natural evolution that we're just driven to explore the universe around us. So I think we can't help it. I think it's, it's simply to be human is to be an explorer. So the Lucy mission uh, is going out to a, a new place in our solar system, a place we've never explored before. And these are called the Trojan Asteroids of Jupiter. And it's a very, very funny name. Um, maybe I'll explain why we call them that. But if you think about uh, the sun's gravity and Jupiter's gravity, Jupiter's the most massive planet in our solar system. And so they kind of have a tug of war with small bodies that are orbiting around uh, other small bodies like asteroids that orbit around in our solar system. And there's a location about 60 degrees in front of where Jupiter is located and about 60 degrees behind where Jupiter is located, where the tug of war between Jupiter and the sun is in balance. And these are called Lagrange points, named after a French mathematician who first defined them. And it turns out if you can capture something in those Lagrange points or near those Lagrange points, they will stay stable for the entire age of the solar system. And so we think that early at forming asteroids that might have been caught in this gravitational stable zone, they are samples from the very beginning of our solar system. Think of them as fossil, and that's what draws us to explore them. It's a chance to go back and look back in time to see what was the early conditions of how planets formed and even how the Earth formed. Where does the, the name of the mission come from, Lucy? Yeah, the name is very clever because it is named after the Australopithecus fossil, Lucy. And so remember, we think about these asteroids as being fossils from the beginning of our solar system. So it was very catchy to uh, name the, the, the mission after this very early hominid fossil, uh, Lucy. And even Lucy itself, the Lucy uh, fossil, was discovered at a time when there was a very popular song by the Beatles huh. of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And so, uh, so the Beatles song inspired the name for the uh, Lucy Australopithecus and then inspired the name for the mission. And, and we carry on that with the Lucy mission because the emblem for our mission is diamond shaped. We, uh, we really love the thread of uh, the name of the mission and the tribute to the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So the Lucy, uh, the Lucy mission to the Trojan asteroids, uh, and we call them Trojans simply because the first of these that were discovered uh, were named after heroes of the Trojan War, mm -hmm. and so the, the name just sort of stuck. But um, what's interesting about these objects is that they're, it's basically a cloud of objects, and it enables us to go by many objects on a particular trajectory. And so we can not only uh, just study the uh, you know, the fossils, it's not like we're just going to one object, we're going to go to a whole population of objects. Mm -hmm. And we hope this will tell us about, um, you know, what were the, the, either the similar or the different characteristics of all the planetesimals that were uh, coming together to form planets. So how many objects exactly are we going to visit? 
So, so it's very complicated, so I always have to look it up. Uh -huh. So I, I brought this very com complicated diagram for the Lucy orbit because it's actually hard to keep it all in your head. Um, I'll just say that, uh, so we're going to be doing two Earth encounters to get enough velocity to, to leave the inner solar system. And actually on the way in April of 2025, we go by a small asteroid in the main belt. Ah, okay. So that's not in the Trojan. No, no, no it's just in the main belt. It just happens to be something along, uh, sort of like a cow along the side of the road. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> and, um, and it was an object discovered by an MIT graduate student named Bobby Buss. Ah, Bobby, yeah. And, um, and so when we realized that this asteroid was going to be on our path, um, we said, oh, we need to find a name for this asteroid. And so we named it, thank you to Bobby Buss, we named this asteroid Donald Johansson. Okay. Donald Johansson was the discoverer of the Lucy Australopithecus oh, fossil. That's such a nice tribute. Yeah, we're really happy about that. And Donald Johansson is happy about it as well. And he's, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of great interactions uh, between the Lucy team and the, the uh, anthropologist uh, Donald Johansson. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see the asteroid Donald Johansson in 2025, and then we get out to uh, the first of these uh, Trojan asteroids named Euripides mm -hmm. in August of 2027, okay. and then uh, the next one comes a month later in September of 2027, uh, and that's Polymele. And so it's, space flight is like this, where you travel a long time, you, you're traveling for six years, and then finally stuff starts happening, <laughs> and it happens very rapidly. So August of 2027, September of 2027, and then uh, in 2028, an asteroid named Lucas, mm -hmm. and in November of 2028, a, an asteroid named Oris. Okay. And so that's for in this the what we call the L4 Trojan cloud in front mm -hmm. of Jupiter. The leading cloud, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we come looping back into the inner solar system. We do another Earth encounter to, to, to swing us out, uh, sort of like a slingshot us out to the L5 uh, Trojan cloud. And um, then we get to the asteroid Patroclus in March of 2033. Wow, that's such a long mission. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 11 years, 12 years from launch. Um, Patroclus is e interesting because it's actually not just one object. It's two objects, each of them about 100 kilometers across. Uh, the the uh, pair It's paired with an oh. asteroid named Manetius. So we'll get two for the price of one oh. when we go by Patroclus. Mm -hmm. We'll see uh, the two objects because they are actually orbiting around each other. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect to learn? from that mission? Oh, and what would be your dream discovery? Well, that's a great question. I, I think this is pure exploration. And so we actually don't have too many preconceptions of exactly what we're going to see. But ideally, we want just simply to see what nature tells us about the chemistry and physical structure of these objects. Uh, we've seen a few asteroids before. Are they like other asteroids we've seen? Or are we going to see something completely new and completely different? Mm -hmm. And uh, the degree to which each one is like one another, or we see a, a variety of compositions, will tell us a lot about how homogeneous or how mixed the early solar system was in terms of all the planetesimals that were coming together to form planets. So it's a, it's, it's a very important test to mm -hmm. some of the earliest processes for how our solar system got to be what it, what it is today. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so NASA is launching another mission this year, also to a small body. This mission is called DART. Can you tell us a little bit about this mission? DART is an acronym for Double Asteroid Redirect Test. And what that means is um, we're sending a spacecraft to an asteroid named Didymos. Mm -hmm. And Didymos actually has a little moon of its own called Didymorph. Asteroids can have moons? Yes, asteroids can have moons. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. That's something we didn't know 30 years ago or we, or we hypothesized decades ago. But that's actually part of the story because uh, a small asteroid can hold on to a moon, but not very strongly. And so what the DART mission is going to do is it's going to send a projectile into the moon around the, the main asteroid. And that projectile will slightly change the orbit of the moon around the asteroid. 
And we'd like to understand that if we push on an asteroid or punch into an asteroid, how effective is that punch in altering its orbit? And this is a really clever way of testing it because the gravity is very sensitive for an asteroid having a moon. The gravity is very sensitive. It doesn't take much of a punch to give you kind of a big measurable effect mm -hmm. on the orbit of that little moon. And the beautiful thing about Didym Didymos and its moon is that this is an asteroid that's far away from the Earth. Uh, and so we're not changing the, ast the orbit <laughs> of that asteroid in any way. And it's not a, th not a threat. You're not creating a global catastrophe. Yeah. No, not, not at all. This asteroid is perfectly safe in a perfectly safe and harmless orbit. Um, but what we're, what we're altering is the orbit of the little moon in any case. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, actually a very clever test of how do asteroids respond if we punch into them mm -hmm. uh, in case we ever had to do it for real. Because uh, by chance, if now or in the future, we ever found a, an asteroid uh, of significant size that was on a direct collision course with the Earth, we would have some experimental um, practice mm -hmm. and some experimental knowledge of uh, how these things would respond to trying to push them a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in, you know, in that case, we'd want to find a way to push an asteroid mm -hmm. just enough so that it did not pose any threat to Earth. Okay, and actually, how likely is this to happen? Uh, a collision of an asteroid with the Earth. We think that uh, something like the uh, large asteroid that impacted the Earth at the end of the Cretaceous period, mm -hmm. to the demise of the dinosaurs, uh, 65 million years ago, is something that is extremely rare. Maybe every hundred million years or so, or on average, a uh, hundred million years. So it was just an unlucky event for the dinosaurs, but maybe for the rise of mammals, it was lucky for us. So, so we may have an asteroid to thank for the fact that we don't have tails uh, <laughs> and, and uh, things like that. Um, smaller things like uh, Tunguska, uh, Siberia 1908, or, or smaller like what uh, was Chelyabinsk, I think it was 2013, mm -hmm. uh, those are things that are maybe on 50 to 100 year time scales mm -hmm. somewhere uh, on, the, on the Earth. And of course, most of the Earth is water. And so the likelihood of any of those kind of events happening over a populated area is, is incredibly rare. But, it, you know, but you know, a one in a thousand chance or something is not quite a zero mm -hmm. chance. So. The hazard of asteroids is real. It's a it's a real thing, but it's an incredibly low probability. Um, but I think it's one that we need to think about and think seriously about, just so that we're knowledgeable uh, in case sometime and sometime uh, this century or the uh, future century this happens, we'll know how to deal with it. So you you told us that Didymos doesn't represent any threat to the Earth. It's just a proof of concept for NASA. But we know of another asteroid, Apophis, that gave a scientist a cold sweat in the past, yeah. <laughs> let's say. Uh, so there's an asteroid named Apophis mm -hmm. uh, with a little bit of tongue in cheek and sense of humor. Apophis is the Egyptian god of destruction. Oh no. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. Apophis was discovered in 2004. And when we, when we first discovered Apophis, like often when we discover asteroids, there's a bit of uncertainty as to where it's going to be in the future because we've only looked at a really tiny piece of its orbit. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to now project where is that orbit going to go? Um, not only maybe in a two-year cycle around the sun, but then just many, many cycles, hundreds of cycles for a century into the future. Where exactly is that asteroid going to be? When we first discovered Apophis, we, had, uh, we could tell it was going to make future close approaches to the Earth. But the precision of which we knew exactly where it was going to be wasn't very good. And it turned out that the uncertainty range for where the uh, asteroid Apophis could be, uh, that uncertainty range included the Earth on, <laughs> on one or more future dates. And so uh, it took a, a lot of uh, uh, exploration of uh, looking for previous images, times when we could 
we happen to have accidentally discovered it but didn't recognize it before. And then ongoing tracking, uh, including using radar to precisely pin down its position. And we now uh, can say with certainty that there is no known impact of Apophis on the Earth. So you are currently trying to convince uh, NASA and uh, the American Congress, which is in charge of giving the money for that kind of thing, uh, you're trying to convince them to send a mission to Apophis. Uh, so you say it doesn't represent any threat. So what's the reason why you want to go to Apophis? Apophis is very interesting for what it's going to do in the year 2029. Mm -hmm. On April 13th of 2029, it happens to be Friday, April no 13th, 2029, uh, nature has a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. uh, the asteroid Apophis will come close to the Earth, um, but it will miss the Earth. And I always have to say it three times, Apophis will miss the Earth, Apophis will miss the Earth, Apophis will miss the Earth, just to make sure there's no, under no misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Apophis will miss the Earth. Um, but what makes it exciting is science, the science opportunity. And the science opportunity is that Apophis will come within five Earth radii of the Earth. So that's about one-tenth the distance to our moon. And in fact, that distance is closer than the distance of geosynchronous satellites. Can you crash into a satellite? Uh, well, probably not, but we'll, we'll check that. But uh, what's interesting is that the Earth is going to have an effect on Apophis. Uh, as you know, the Earth and the Moon, there's always tides between the Earth and the Moon. And th this asteroid Apophis will come so close to the Earth that we think that there will be stresses, tidal stress, pulling on the asteroid Apophis. And it may even make the asteroid vibrate or shake or have asteroid quakes. Mm. And so this is like nature doing a little experiment on the asteroid. This Apophis encounter is incredibly rare or this experiment is incredibly rare because an asteroid the size of Apophis comes this close to the Earth about once per thousand years. So this, it's a once per thousand year natural experiment that nature is doing for us. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is measure or watch what happens. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is maybe we could put seismometers or something on the surface of the asteroid or somehow have a spacecraft, spacecraft there to watch what happens to the asteroid Apophis because how the asteroid responds to these tidal stresses from the Earth tells us about how the asteroid is put together. Mm -hmm. And this is another piece of the puzzle about what are these hazardous asteroids like. And if we ever have to push on one of these asteroids, so it's sort of a follow-on to the DART mission experiment, mm -hmm. if we ever have to deal with one of these asteroids, it sure would be important to know how they're put together. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think scientifically it's a fascinating question as well, but I think for what I call the science of planetary defense, being knowledgeable about how we might deal with an asteroid threat some, some century in the future, mm -hmm. nature is handing us a gift, a gift for incredible knowledge, and I, I think we should need to find a way to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. So you say that Klaus Encounter will happen in 2029? Uh, so that leaves little time to actually develop a mission to that asteroid. So what are your options? Yeah. So, um, well, we studied this. I assigned this to an MIT class. Mm -hmm. This is what a professor does when he, uh, he or she has an idea. Uh, you assign it to the class and let the students figure it out. So we did a project called MIT Project Apophis, where we designed a mission. The students designed a mission to show that we could do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a spacecraft uh, in uh, working in space now called OSIRIS-REx. Yeah. OSIRIS-REx just sampled an asteroid, an asteroid named Bennu, mm -hmm. and that sample is coming back to Earth in 2023. That's pretty amazing. You sent a robot to pick up some rocks on an asteroid. And we're bringing those samples back to Earth. Mm -hmm. So that spacecraft will drop off the samples. The, the samples are now in a capsule aboard the spacecraft and the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft will come by the Earth. It will release the capsule. The capsule will come and enter the Earth's atmosphere where we'll pick it up. Mm 
Mm -hmm. pick up those samples. The spacecraft will then fire its little thrusters so that it misses the Earth. Mm -hmm. And it will be now have its uh, free, uh, freely available, not free for money because mm -hmm. everything costs something, but uh, it's an available, fantastically capable spacecraft. And it turns out that we can uh, send that up OSIRIS-REx spacecraft on a new trajectory that will let it go to Apophis uh, oh. later in 2029, some months after the encounter. Okay. So the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft can see what Apophis looks like after it encountered the Earth. Uh, and so I, I think that's a, a brilliant idea. and a, it's, I think it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. to send an existing, capable, fantastic spacecraft to Apophis and we simply now need to find a way to get the before look at the asteroid Apophis or the during the encounter look at the asteroid Apoph mm -hmm. Apophis. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> so let's dream a little bit now. <laughs> if you had unlimited resources to build your own space mission, what would you do? Where would you go? Yeah, that's a great question. And we all wish we could do that. Um, I think the first thing I would do and it's actually happening, is I would have a space-based telescope, it could be orbiting the Earth or in the vicinity of the Earth, mm -hmm. that is doing a complete survey, a complete census of the asteroids that are around us in the inner solar system. Uh, I think it's an important uh, responsibility of astronomers and, and asteroid and planetary scientists um, to really understand uh, the level of hazard that uh, asteroids and or comets pose to the Earth. Uh, it's not very great, it's a very small level uh, of hazard, but it's something that we can know and define and be certain of. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a responsible thing to do to be fully knowledgeable of any significant threat that might be on the horizon uh, over the course of the next two to three centuries. And the reason I say that is it's, it's now in our capability to be knowledgeable of any possible threat uh, over the next 200 to 300 years. And now that we have that technology, I think it's uh, almost a moral responsibility mm -hmm. for us as scientists to, to take care of that detail about the safety of our planet. Thank you very much, Rick. My pleasure. It's so great to, to be here with you and to uh, share these ideas. And uh, hopefully it stimulates some new ideas for a lot of young people out there. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Mission. Stop the Darn mission. On the way for humanity's first ever planetary defense test mission.